Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. Albans Catholic Church at St. Cecilia's, part of St. Cattery. I am Father Nathan Davis. I was ordained one month ago today in Houston, and this is my first assignment as a priest to be the parochial administrator of St. Albans, and I'm also a parochial vicar at St. Cattery. What is this going to be? It's going to be a series of four talks on Newman's face, his life, sermons, his writings and poetry, and then his prayers, meditations, and devotions. Why are we doing this? Because, first of all, I love St. John Henry Newman, and also he was just canonized last October 2019, and a lot of people aren't really familiar with him, so I came up with these talks last summer at my parish assignment and to help prepare people for the canonization at that time, but now that he's canonized, it's also a good way to um, familiarize people with Newman as a saint. So this, this talk is on his, basically his biography. So the handout you have has a nice chronological timeline and then a couple select photos that I took myself over there in Littlemore and Birmingham, Birmingham, England, and we'll talk more about what those photos represent as the talk goes on. Newman was born in London. He was the eldest of six children. His father was a banker and his mother a descendant from the Huguenot refugees. As a child, Newman was a reader he was not interested in schoolyard games, but enjoyed horseback riding, long walks, boating on the Thames, cliff climbing, and he even attempted to row around, a row around the Isle of Wight in a fog. He also loved music his whole life, and he played the violin. In his book, Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which I will discuss in greater detail in my third lecture, Newman wrote this. I was brought up from a child to take great delight in reading the Bible, but I had no formed religious convictions until I was 15. Of course, I had a perfect knowledge of my catechism. He was a born leader. At age 11, he started a magazine called The Spy. He also took a prominent part in the school play each year. The school he attended from age 7 was a private boarding school called Great Ealing School. It's now defunct. It closed in 1908. At age 15, John Henry underwent a conversion. His classics teacher, Walter Mayers, had lent him some books from, it, from the English Calvinist tradition, which he read and fell under the influence of a definite creed in his work, and received into his intellect, quote, impressions of dogma, which, through God's mercy, have never been effaced or obscured." Close quote. He became an evangelical Calvinist and held the typical belief that the Pope was the Antichrist. To the end of his life, Newman looked back on his conversion to evangelical Christianity in 1816 as the saving of his soul. In Apologia, he wrote, quote, I read Joseph Milner's Church History and was nothing short of enamored of the long extracts from St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, and the other fathers which I found there. I read them as being the religion of the primitive Christians." Close quote. A third element of his conversion was this, quote, I am obliged to mention, though I do it with great reluctance, another deep imagination, which at this time, the autumn of 1816, took possession of me. There can be no mistake about the fact, namely, that it was the will of God that I should lead a single life. This anticipation, which has held its ground almost continuously ever since, was more or less connected in my mind with the notion that my calling in life would require such a sacrifice as celibacy involved, as, for instance, missionary work among the heathen, to which I had a great drawing for some years. It also strengthened my feeling of separation from the visible world, 
of which I have spoken above. Close quote. From the Ealing School, Newman went directly to Trinity College, Oxford, at age 16. He excelled, but he was under such pressure and he worked so hard that he almost failed his final exams. After that, he tried for a fellowship at Oriel College, which was sort of a trend-setting college in Oxford in those days. Newman was successful and was elected to be a fellow at Oriel. This put him among other brilliant minds such as John Keeble, E. B. Pusey, Pearl Fruit, and the Wilberforces. They were instrumental in influencing Newman away from his Calvinist and evangelical beliefs toward a high church Anglicanism. In May 1825, he was ordained to the Anglican priesthood and became a tutor at Oriel. By 1827, he was so respected that he was appointed examiner for the Bachelor of Arts degree. In 1828, he was appointed vicar at the Univers University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. Around this time, his prayer life grew significantly in terms of his intercessory prayer, which, of course, I will talk about in my fourth lecture. Being the vicar of St. Mary's also brought with it the responsibility for the people of the village of Littlemore. In June 1828, Newman took an informal census of Littlemore and found he had about 300 souls in his care. Newman built a little church there, which was completed in 1835 and still stands today. It's called St. Mary and St. Nicholas. Just as an aside, Littlemore is a little village south of Oxford proper, uh, about five miles, and Newman just had such a pastoral spirit for the uh, people of his parish there, their Anglicans, that he didn't want them to have to, you know, walk or ride a horse or buggy or something up into Oxford for church. So that's why he built the parish, the little church there. And he, he started a fundraiser. Um, he called his rich friends, other priests around the country, and he solicited many donations. Even the little, the children gave their pence, and they also got their name on the big donor board at the back of that church. Uh, something like, you know, the children of, of St. Mary and St. Nicholas of Littlemore. So, uh, he just had this pastoral sense about him that the people need uh, their own church here so they don't have to come to Oxford, and a couple years later it happened. Newman's good friend, Pearl Fruit, was suffering from consumption, called tuberculosis today. So in December 1832, Newman went with him and his father on a Mediterranean tour. Seeing Rome, Newman wrote, quote, A wonderful place, the first city, mind, which I have ever much praised, he writes the day after his arrival, the most wonderful place in the world, he says in another letter. And now what can I say of Rome but that it is the first of, of cities, and all that I ever saw are but as dust, even dear Oxford and inclusive, compared with Rome's majesty and glory. Close quote. His last letter from Rome, written on April 7th, shows no abatement of enthusiasm. What he saw there has, quote, stolen my heart, stolen away half of my heart. Oh, that Rome was not Rome, but I seem to see as, see as clear as day that union with her is impossible. So he's talking about, as an Anglican, maybe becoming in union with the Church of Rome. The fruits went home, but Newman went to Sicily, where he hiked across the island with an Italian guide. During the hike, Newman became seriously ill, and he might have died if not for his guide, who cared for him and helped him to recover. On his journey home by ship, June 16, 1833, he wrote the famous poem, The Pillar of the Cloud, which has, is known by another title, which you might be able to guess as I read the first line. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home, lead thou me on. Newman reached home on July 9th, 1833, and five days later, John Keeble preached his famous sermon called the National Apostasy. This is recognized to be the official start of the Oxford Movement. Uh, you want to pick up a handout 
Uh, there's two people that just came in. Thanks. The Oxford movement was a movement of high church members of the Church of England, which eventually developed into what we call Anglo-Catholicism. The movement, whose original devotees were mostly associated with Oxford, argued for the reinstatement of some older Christian traditions of faith and their inclusion into Anglican liturgy and theology. They thought of Anglicanism as one of the three branches of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the other two branches being the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. This became known as the Branch Theory. The Oxford Movement was also called Tractarianism because of its series of publications, The Tracts for the Times, published from 1833 to 1841. Tractarians were also disparagingly referred to as Newmanites, after John Henry Newman, or Puseyites, after Newman's 18, uh, 1845 conversion when E.B. Pusey became the leader of the Tractarians. Other well-known Tractarians included John Keeble, Charles Marriott, Richard Froude, Robert Wilberforce, Isaac Williams, and William Palmer. The Oxford Movement fought to, to prove the apostolic succession of the Church of England and to maintain spiritual independence from the state. They saw liberalism within religion as a most powerful enemy. Liberalism here does not refer to progressive Christianity or political liberalism, but to the philosophical and religious thought that developed and grew as a consequence of the Enlightenment. Liberalism is an undogmatic method of understanding God through the use of Scripture by applying various modern methods of interpretation, also called hermeneutics, to understand Scripture. Liberalism from the start embraced the methodologies of the Enlightenment, empirical evidence, and the use of reason alone as the basis for interpreting the Bible, faith, and theology. The leaders of the Oxford Movement published a series of tracts called Tracts for the Times. In the end, there are 90 of these tracts published. The most famous one was Newman's Tract Number 90, which was titled, Remarks on Certain Passages in the 39 Articles, and was published on January 25th, 1841. In this tract, Newman attempted to prove that the Church of England's 39 articles could be interpreted to be consistent with Catholic doctrine. Members of the Oxford University leadership, bishops and clergy in the Anglican Church saw this as an attack on the very foundations of the Church of England, its nature, of course, being Protestant. They thought Newman was leading it too close to Rome. Newman was ordered by his bishop to cease publication of tracts, and the Oxford Board of Heads of Colleges officially censured Newman. In my third talk, I will talk a lot more about Tract 90, because it is so important to understanding uh, Newman's life and conversion. The confusion and fury from Tract 90 convinced Newman to retreat to Littlemore, which he did on April 19, 1842. He wanted a quiet place to pray, think, study, and read. He resigned from being the vicar of St. Mary's, but he remained a fellow of Oregon. His life was centered in Littlemore, and he rarely went into Oxford. At this point, Newman leased what had been a carriage house, barn and stables about a block away from the Littlemore church. And you can see a picture on the back of the handout Of. The top picture, Newman College of Littlemore, is a look inside the, inside the college and you have the different rooms or cottages on the left. And then at the end, the building um, that goes across the picture, that's the stable that he converted into a library because it was the biggest room in the whole complex. And so it was the only place he could house all of his many, many, many books. So that now today is the library. And then these cottages on the left, there's five or six of them. You can uh, coordinate with the sisters of the work who run the place. And you can stay there um, for a meager donation. 
and it's very comfortable. That's where I stayed for about a month when I was there in 2017. And they have a little, they have the chapel that Newman set up, pretty much exactly how he liked it. And then next to that, they preserved his living quarters with a couple, it's just set up very uh, austerely how he had it, pretty much exactly. And it's a great place to pray. And in the library, great place to study Newman. Unfortunately, it's right across the street from a pub. So, uh, sleeping at night with the windows open, on Friday and Saturday especially, was not happening. Like I said, he converted the stable into his library. The barn had already been turned into cottages, and so Newman made the room next to his own a chapel. Some of his closest friends joined him there, and they kind of lived like monks. They actually had to uh, put curtains over the windows of the chapel because the neighbors like to peek in and try and see what they're doing. And are they really monks, or uh, what are these crazy guys doing? So he wanted privacy and uh, designed it that way. Around this time, Newman decided he must leave his position at St. Mary and St. Nicholas Church in Littlemore. This led to his delivering one of his most famous sermons, Parting of Friends. And we'll talk about that one a lot more in the next one, because that is a really great sermon. And uh, his emotions come through in a profound way. During the time he lived in the cottages at Littlemore, from 1842 to 45, Newman worked on a book, on writing a book titled, Development of Doctrine. In writing this book, he finally became convinced that he must become Catholic. In studying the Arian heresy, he first took the view that semi-Arians were like the Anglicans, or a middle ground, a, vi a via media between the Catholic position and the heretical Arians. However, as he studied history and wrote the book, he came to realize that the semi-Arians were just as heretical as the Arians. Hence the quote, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Newman saw the similarity for what it was. Anglicanism, being in the middle ground, was not Catholic. They, the only way to be Catholic, to truly be in the church Christ founded, was to be in full communion with the Pope, the chair of St. Peter. There were four primary reasons that Newman was, became convinced to become Catholic. And there's a test on this at the end, so make sure you get that. If you're watching the video, I'll find you. Just kidding. First, the fallacy of the via media, that middle ground, it's fallacious, it's wrong, as he discovered in writing this Development on Doctrine essay. Secondly, the reaction to Track 90, which I kind of already mentioned, the, this violent rhetorical assault that he underwent because he was trying to argue for the Catholicity of the 39 Articles. And the way that the bishops and other church leaders reacted uh, really shocked him and deeply hurt him. Of course, it opened his eyes to what he must do, so I guess it was good. Thirdly, a thing commonly referred to as the Jerusalem Bishopric. It was a joint Anglican and Lutheran bishop or Episcopal see that the Anglican and Lutheran churches created and they planted this bishop in the Holy Land to establish a firmer position of, for Protestantism in, uh, in the Holy Land. And this, this action gave Newman solid evidence that the Church of England was not apostolic. If it had been apostolic, truly, it would have seen that there's already a bishop meant bishops there. You know, you have the Eastern bishops, and uh, there's, I don't know, probably a Catholic bishop, so anyways. Uh, that was another major, major point. Fourthly, Oxford politics. The election of several liberal evangelicals to high positions at the university and the persecution of his fellow Tractarians was another major driving force behind him becoming Catholic. Newman confided this realization that he had to convert to a very small number of people. Newman heard that a Catholic priest, a passionist missionary named Dominic Barbary, was to be in, be in Oxford. 
Father Dominic was a missionary priest sent to England to convert Anglicans to the Catholic faith. Newman invited Father Dominic to stay a night in Littlemore on his journey south from Oxford back to Belgium. Father Dominic was to arrive by coach at Oxford on the afternoon of October 8th. Up to the very day itself, Newman did not speak to the community at Littlemore of this intention. Newman's close friends, John Del Garens and Ambrose St. John, were to meet the Passionist Father in Oxford. Del Garens has left us the following account of what occurred. It's a kind of a long quote, but it's awesome. At that time, all of us except St. John, though we did not doubt Newman would become a Catholic, were anxious and ignorant of his intentions in detail. About three o'clock, I went to take my hat and stick and walk across the fields to Oxford where the coach had stopped. As I was taking my stick, Newman said to me in a very low and quiet tone, When you see your friend, will you tell him that I wish him to receive me into the Church of Christ? I said yes, and no more. I told Father Dominic that as he was dismounting from the top of the coach, he said, God be praised, and neither of us spoke again till we reached Littlemore. That's the end of the quote. It was storming and pouring rain that night. When Father Dominic reached the cottages, he was brought into the library to warm himself by the fire. Here, Newman met him, knelt before him, and asked him to receive him <clears throat> into full communion. The picture. In the middle of the back of the handout, is a bronze sculpture in the church, Catholic parish of St. Dominic, of Blessed Dominic Barbary, next to the Little Moore College, of Newman, you know, genuflecting before Dominic Barbary in front of the fireplace. There's still a, a fireplace in the library, but it's not real. It's like a mock-up, um, because they had to do some remodeling for like, state uh, health codes or something. So there's a door, but it has like a, a mock fireplace attached to the door in the same place where the fireplace used to be. So it's kind of interesting. Newman's confession went late into the night on that night, and Father Dominic grew very tired. So they paused, they paused the confession and continued it the next day. On October 9th, 1845, Newman, Newman finished his life confession and was, was received into the Catholic Church by Father Dominic. One story I like to tell um, that I learned about there at the Newman College is that the first mass for the Father Dominic said for Newman, um, they didn't have a real altar, so they used a uh, like a folding writing desk, so they folded it flat, and that became the altar for Newman's first mass, for, you know, for, to receive communion, first communion. But after that, Newman never used that desk again to write on. He, revered it as an altar of Christ, and it's still there in the library, and uh, it's, it's tilted up in desk style, but every day when I would go into the library, I would kiss the, uh, kiss the desk altar and venerate it. The shockwaves from Newman's conversion were great. He suffered the loss of many personal friends. Some of his family members even broke off their relationships with him. Obviously, he had to cease all activity as an Anglican priest and he was ostracized from Oxford circles, which stung him severely. All his friends in the Littlemore cottages became Catholic, though. Three years after his conversion, Newman wrote a short novel called Loss and Gain, which I will discuss in greater detail in my third talk. This book is the story of a young Oxford student who, be who begins his studies as an Anglican, but ends up converting to Catholicism. This is one of Newman's most approachable works, and has many parallels to his own conversion story, despite the fact it is not technically an autobiography. In February 1846, Newman left Littlemore and moved to Oscott, which is near Birmingham, where the bishop was Nicholas Cardinal Weissman. October of that same year, Newman went to Rome and was ordained to the Catholic priesthood, and was awarded the, de the degree of Doctor of Divinity by Pope Pius IX. Newman's love for a sort of monastic life with his close friends in Littlemore drove him to become an oratorian in the style of St. Philip Neri. 
The Oratorian Way of Life consists of a small community of priests and lay brothers who live in a town or city and administer a parish. They do not take formal vows, but they live in bonds of charity. The core of St. Philip's spirituality focuses on an unpretentious return to the lifestyle of the first disciples of Christ. The object of the Institute is threefold, prayer, preaching, and the sacraments. Returning to England, Newman founded an oratory in Maryvale, which is near Oscott, now the site of the Maryvale Institute, a college of theology. Then his oratory moved a couple of times and finally settled in Edge Baston, where they built a large church and spacious accommodations. Again, for Newman's library, they built this room, which you can see on the bottom picture of the handout, his library at the Birmingham Oratory. It's got two levels and a wrought iron spiral staircase to get up to the second level. And then a, um, a huge skylight in the ceiling to let in the natural light, which Newman, um, he liked the, the kind of lights that they had on the ships that he traveled on, and like when he went to Rome or the Mediterranean. So he modeled that skylight after like a ship's, ship's light. Before they occupied Edge Baston, however, Newman founded the London Oratory with Father William Frederick Faber as its superior. After settling down as an oratorian, Newman's life was still very busy. He traveled, preached, and wrote many things. He was an avid letter writer, and the, and the 31 volumes of his letters we have today speak to his widespread appeal and his frenetic activity. I'll show you some of his letters in my third lecture. Newman was widely known and popular, but as a moderate, folks on both extremes disliked him. Newman's zeal for truth, his polemical tendencies, and his satiric wit sometimes got him into trouble. The prime example of this is the Achille trial. Giacinto Achille, a former Dominican friar turned anti-Catholic, wrote and spoke harshly about English Catholics, especially Newman. Newman wrote and lectured to defend himself and his fellow Catholics and to attack Achille, quoting Cardinal Wiseman's detailed expose of Achille. Newman thought he was safe in doing so because he was repeating facts that Wiseman used. Newman called Achille an, quote, infidel and a hypocrite and a, quote, profligate under cow. Newman described Achille as one, of, as one who, quote, made the wife of a tailor faithless to her husband and lived publicly and traveled about with the wife of a chorus singer, close quote. Newman also said of Achille, you were obliged to give hush money to the father of one of your victims, as we learn from an official document of the Neapolitan police, to be known for habitual incontinency. Your name came before the civil tribunal at Corfu for your crime of adultery. You have put the crown on your offenses by as long as you could, by denying them all. You have professed to seek after truth when you were ravening after sin." Close quote. This led to a libel suit, <laughs> as you might imagine. Achilles sued Newman, and it went to trial starting June 21, 1852. The trial lasted three days, and Newman could not produce the Wiseman evidence sufficient to exonerate himself. Newman was found guilty and was sentenced to pay a fine of 100 pounds sterling. Ironically, he received a long lecture from the judge about his moral deterioration since becoming a Catholic. Newman's reputation in the public eye actually grew better because of this incident. Many people sided with him and discredited Achille. Just after the Achille affair ended, Newman had the occasion to preach one of his most famous sermons, The Second Spring. This was at the First Provincial Synod of Westminster in 1852, after the reestablishment of the Catholic hierarchy. And as you might expect, I will talk more about that great sermon in my next talk next week. Another important story from Newman's life is his experience with the Irish University. Some Irish bishops, led by Paul Cullen, 
wanted to start a Catholic University of Ireland to rival Oxford and Cambridge. Cullen wanted Newman to help create the new, new university and to be its first rector. Newman went to Dublin in 1854, met with the bishops, educators, and benefactors to prepare to start this Irish university. He lectured in Dublin, preached many sermons, and started the Literary and Historical Society, now the oldest debating club in the University College Dublin. However, Newman's educational phil phil uh, philosophy was not shared by Bishop Cullen. Cullen hesitated and eventually scrapped Newman's ideas and his rectorship, leaving Newman to return to his Birmingham oratory. I'm kind of glossing over that to make it just short and more to the point. It is a very complicated situation, this Irish University thing. I'm still trying to read more about it and understand, like, really why it failed. Um, but I think for now, just let's just say, you know, there's those philosophical and administrative differences. Newman felt like a failure, but it, the, his book, The Idea of a University, was a success. This book is a collection of his lectures and an explanation of his philosophy of education, and it stands today as a very good read, um, kind of prophetic as to the, the goal of a university education and the, uh, his idea of a true university. Newman's prayer life was intense and devout, both in his community of oratorians and privately. One important aspect of his private prayers was the daily set of prayers he used from Lancelot Andrews, which he translated from Greek to English and kept by his prayer and used daily until his death. We will examine these prayers in further detail in my fourth and last lecture. From the latter half of 1886, Newman's health began to fail. His sight failed him and his vision grew worse and worse. Also, his fingers and hands lost their strength and he could not physically celebrate the Mass. He said Mass for the last time on Christmas Day in 1889. On the 11th of August, 1890, he died of pneumonia at the Birmingham Oratory. Eight days later, his body was buried alongside his dearest friend, Ambrose St. John, in the cemetery at Rednall Hill, Birmingham, at the country house of the Oratory. In accordance with his expressed wishes, Newman was buried in the grave of his lifelong friend, St. John. The pall over the coffin bore the motto that Newman adopted for use as a cardinal, Cor ad cor loquitur, or heart speaks to heart, which traces to St. Francis de Sales and which reveals the secret of Newman's unaffected, graceful, tender, and penetrating eloquence. Ambrose St. John had become a Roman Catholic at around the same time as Newman, and the two men have a joint memorial a stone inscribed with the motto Newman had chosen, Ex umbris et imaginibus in veritatem, out of shadows and images into the truth, which traces to Plato's allegory of the cave. Newman's grave was opened on the 2nd of October 2008 with the intention of moving any remains to a tomb inside the Birmingham Oratory for their more convenient veneration as relics during Newman's consideration for beatification. However, his wooden coffin was found to have disintegrated and virtually no bones were found. Um, I re tried to research this and maybe there was one or two bones, but it's kind of debated. In my mind, I have found proof. A representative of the Fathers of the Birmingham Oratory alleged that this was because the coffin was wooden and the burial, place, the burial took place at a very damp site. Contemporary sources show that the coffin was covered with a softer type of soil than the clay marl of the grave site. Long story short, we have very few relics of Newman, mostly some hairs that his barber saved. So thank God for that barber. Newman's cause began in 1958 when Archbishop Grimshaw of Birmingham constituted the court needed for an ordinary process of canonization. In 1991, Newman was proclaimed venerable by Pope John Paul II after a thorough examination of his life and work by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. 
After this, Jack Sullivan, a man studying for the diaconate in Boston, Massachusetts, was on the verge of complete paralysis in 2000 and 2001, and he was miraculously healed after praying to Newman. The miracle was investigated and confirmed by the Vatican. Newman was beatified on September 19, 2010, by Pope Benedict XVI during his visit to the United Kingdom. A second miracle, necessary for his canonization, was approved by the Vatican in November 2018. This miracle concerned the healing of a pregnant American woman named Melissa Villalobos. The decree approving this miracle was authorized to be promulgated on 12 February 2019. Canonization made Newman the first person from England who has lived since the 17th century, officially recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church. Newman appeals to me because of his ongoing lifelong conversion, his love for truth, and his desire for his heart to speak to God's heart, and likewise for God's heart and Newman's heart to speak to our hearts. And when it comes to Newman, there's a lot to listen to. Much of what he said in the 19th century is still very relevant today. I'd like to end with a few quotes um, from different important figures about Newman. Pope Benedict XVI said, The truth revealed through scripture and tradition and articulated by the church's magisterium sets us free. Cardinal Newman realized this, and he left us an outstanding example of faithfulness to reveal truth. Great writers and communicators of his stature are needed in the church today, and it is my hope that devotion to him will inspire many to follow in his footsteps. Pope St. John Paul II said, Newman's remarkable life, void of sham and ambition, but steeped in a prayerful communion with the unseen, while it remained alive to the problems of his age in church and society, continues to inspire, to uplift, and to enlighten. Archbishop Vincent Nichols, Archbishop of Westminster, said this, John Henry Newman appeals to me above all else as a parish priest. For 30 years or so, he served the people of his parish in Birmingham with great practical kindness, thoughtfulness, and self-sacrifice. He was esteemed by the priests of the diocese, an accolade not easily won, and loved by his people. They turned out in their thousands on the day of his burial. In all probability, they had not read his books or letters, although they had heard his sermons. But they knew his way of life and his love for them. What a marvelous gift that an English parish priest is to be beatified. How much encouragement can we take from this? And then the obituary in the Times published the day after his death. <clears throat> of one thing we may be sure, that the memory of, his, of this pure and noble life, untouched by worldliness, will endure, and that whether Rome canonizes him or not, he will be canonized in the thoughts of pious people of many creeds in England. The saint in him will survive. Let us close with a brief prayer, and then I'll take any questions uh, that you might have. I think I'll stop the recording uh, for the questions. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now and ever shall be, for all of God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us the example of St. John Henry Newman as someone who sought to speak to your heart and to have your heart speak to his. Inspire us this day with the words of St. John Henry Newman, his prayers, his intercessions, and his heart speaking to our heart. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord.